the attachment representation or the IWM, the internal working model, they are predictable throughout childhood and adolescence into adulthood and the IWM and experience inform and influence each other. Attachment theory is one of those cultural phenomenons right now, it seems, that has been around for a few years where books have come out and people use it especially for talking about adult relationships and your how your attachment style affects your ability to have good personal relationships. And I thought in this video I'd share with you some things that I've learned while I was doing my master's in psychology and hopefully give you a broader background and some proper empirical information about how not everything is as straightforward as it may seem and that attachment is actually a quite complex phenomenon. Let's dive in. Attachment research has produced a lot of much debated and highly contrasting results actually since the 1960s. Numerous studies suggest that secure attachment predicts fewer behavioral issues and greater socio and emotional skills, while attachment insecurity links to challenging and maladaptive, as we call them, outcomes. But attachment is complex and to determine whether or to what extent it predicts subsequent development, a number of factors have to be considered. These are how does attachment develop, how is it assessed and how constant is it? And I'm going to give you the conclusion right now. Attachment is one variable that influences child development but it's a very dynamic and complex situation and interplay of biological and environmental factors as well. So in general, attachment is the emotional connection between an infant and their primary caregiver. John Bowlby's empirical research started with delinquent boys in the 1940s, and that resulted in his seminal paper, 44 Juvenile Thieves. And based on that, he came up with his theory that attachment is universal, context independent, survival aiding, as in like it's necessary for the baby because a baby can't take care of themselves, obviously. It's a primary drive in an infant to emotionally connect with and derive security from one primary caregiver. According to his theory, attachment develops through these four phases. Phase one is pre-attachment from birth to eight weeks where the infant shows no specific preference or emotional connection. Phase two is early attachment or attachment in the making between two and seven months where the infant differentiates between caregivers and develops a preference. Phase three, specific attachment from eight months to three years is where the child exhibits stranger anxiety and separation anxiety from the preferred caregiver. And then phase four, the partnership, and then two to three years as well, where first of all, the infant develops internal working models or representations of expected interaction. If I smile, you feed me. And also goal corrected behavior with the caregiver. That is the infant realizing that the caregiver's goals may be different from their own. So if I smile, you may not always feed me because maybe you're busy. Since it has been around for so long, the theory has obviously had a lot of research and some has been proven, some has been debunked. For instance, in a longitudinal study with 60 children, Schaffer and Emerson debunked Bowlby's view of attachment as monotropic, meaning just one primary caregiver or one primary attachment style. And they showed that children actually form multiple attachments of varying styles depending on who they're with. So it's not just one that is either secure or insecure. Also, although it may be universal, international studies suggest that the interpretation of attachment styles have to be considered within their cultural context. For example, Japanese parents might interpret secure behaviors as accommodating and spoiling. Now, how is attachment assessed? Mary Salter Ainsworth, she developed an empirical method to determine the kind of attachment, the attachment quality based on caregiver sensitivity, and she identified these three styles. So between 1953 and 1955, she studied 26 families 
in Uganda. And then building on that work, she studied 26 families in Maryland in the U.S. in 1963. And what the P does is it observes an infant's behavior throughout a series of scenarios, including how they interact with their primary caregiver in a new environment. So basically, mother and child come to a room and there are toys. How does a child react when the mother leaves? How does the child react when a stranger is in the room? How does the child react when the mother leaves the child alone with the stranger? And then how does a child react when the mother returns? And so insecure, avoidant children appear relatively unfazed by the caregiver leaving. But as the name implies, they tend to avoid or ignore them when they come back. They may or may not interact with a stranger who is in the room with them. Securely attached children use their caregiver as a safe base. So they freely explore and play with the toys and interact with the stranger as long as the caregiver is there. And then reach out and seek closeness to the caregiver when they return. See, insecure resistant children remain physically close throughout much of the whole scenario, but keep the distance from the stranger and they get visibly upset when the caregiver leaves. When the caregiver comes back, the child can show some anger and remain close by, but is not seeking the kind of physical comfort that a secure child would seek. A few decades later, the disorganized attachment category was added by Maine and Solomon, and basically this describes infants who don't seem to know how to act upon their caregiver's return. So they might freeze, they might move towards them, they might turn away, or they show a mix of generally avoidant and resistant behaviors. So the strange situation procedure is not without its issues. We're not going to go into the details there, but basically for older children, attachment can also be assessed using other methods. But keep in mind that Bowlby argued that a child without a clear and secure attachment may be, quote unquote, severely disturbed. So now, to what extent does your mother leaving you in a room with a stranger when you were a toddler affect how you behave as a teenager or even as an adult. What's the evidence? Farah and Atal, their findings support the claim that attachment insecurity correlates to subsequent child behavioral issues. For example, especially insecure avoidant children have higher externalizing behavior problems than the securely attached. So externalizing behavior problems means they lash out and they act out. And then attachment behavior problems occur both in high and low income families. So it may indeed be universal. Attachment effects on externalizing behavior is significantly higher for boys, suggesting that insecurity in girls may express as internalizing behavior. So instead of lashing out and getting angry at others, boys tend to get angry at others. Girls tend to get angry at themselves. So there's a big portion of socialization and education in there. And then D, and this is going to be important, the age and method of assessment moderates the effect size. So later assessments using other methods have greater predictability of externalizing behaviors, indicating that there may be a developmental change during the third year that affects the link between attachment and subsequent behaviors. So the researchers, and again, this is a meta-analysis of over 60 independent papers, so they're comparing apples with oranges as well, but it's a large study, so findings are quite convincing. And they do suggest further research into the consistency of these internal working models and how continuous parenting quality also impacts the attachment. So this last point of D, the method and the age of the assessment, it raises an important point because it suggests that either the specific attachment formed according to Bowlby's theory during phase three may not be stable, may not carry forward, and may therefore be unreliable as a predictor for future development, or this SSP assessment is unreliable. Obviously, attachment stability is a key point here that must be considered because we're saying whatever happens to you as a toddler affects you as a grown-up. So is this attachment stable or does it change over the years? In order to see how that affects it, we have to look at these internal working models because they contain a lot of information. 
And based on a longitudinal Minnesota study, Roof in 2016 argued that the attachment representation, or the IWM, the internal working model, they are predictable throughout childhood and adolescence into adulthood, and the IWM and experience inform and influence each other to affect behavior. So yes, they are predictable. Yes, they inform behavior, but so does the experience and the context that you are in. The schema is this is another word for internal representation because it contains key parts of your sense of self and your representation of how you interpret your caregiver. If they are updated and if they change as you get older, then these are the questions that remain. If the internal working model evolves after infancy through parenting and peer influences and siblings and friends, wouldn't the associated attachment also change? Given the complication of children forming multiple attachments of varying styles, you can have one attachment style to your mother, one to your father, one to your grandparents, one to your uncles, aunts, siblings, friends, whoever is in your life. What are the mechanisms? We don't know what the mechanisms are that this one style would prevail and would continue to influence your behaviors. And then also, at what age do specific working models become generalized? So what does seem clear is that caregiver sensitivity is the thing that continually determines attachment quality. And that makes sense, right? Because the baby doesn't form the attachment in and of itself. The baby is also influenced by how the caregiver reacts to them. So the birth of siblings, the caregiver's mental health, the caregiver's marital issues, all of those may negatively influence the child's attachment security because these life events affect your ability to parent effectively and affect your ability to, to parent to a high degree of quality in terms of what the child needs. We know this because parental sensitivity training has shown to provide positive effects on attachment security, especially for children around the age of three. So this concept of where the parent intuits and knows what the child needs is called mind-mindedness. And there's also an argument to be made that this mind-mindedness has to be dynamic and age-appropriate as the child grows. You can't just always feed them when they smile at you, right? Parenting should include eventually setting boundaries and teaching problem solving and also respecting a child's privacy. And this is where, again, I would argue that awareness of your psychological type preferences are so handy and so impactful because, for example, I was working with a client many years ago. She's an introverted mother of an extroverted child and she wasn't aware of it. They, I think she separated from her partner or they moved house or something and she, as the introverted mother, created a new childhood bedroom for her daughter with a reading nook, with comfy chairs, with thick curtains, something that she would have totally appreciated as a child, somewhere to pull away from the world where she could just go and be by herself and do her thinking and her reading. But the child is extroverted. So the daughter didn't know how to appreciate this room because she doesn't enjoy doing these introverted activities that the mother enjoyed. Make sense? Let's wrap this up then. Research over multiple decades basically suggests that attachment does influence development both positively and negatively. However, it's difficult to establish a causal connection and saying this particular style leads to that particular behavior as an adult. Attachment insecurity is a risk factor, but it is currently unclear how or why one particular style of the multiple attachment a child forms carries forward since attachment develops across phases and as a function of caregiving quality, which itself is subject to a range of cultural and environmental circumstances. So attachment can be assessed at different ages using different methods. And overall, later assessments appear to be more predictive. But still, we know about the brain's plasticity as well. And attachment, here is the quote, is not the only thing that predicts important outcomes. Your relationships with peers, siblings, schools in neighborhoods, and the socioeconomic status as well are all known to have important influences. So maybe... <laughs> Don't make partner decisions and relationship decisions based on attachment styles alone.
there you have it. Attachment is complex. It's not quite straightforward. There are a bunch of questions still to keep in mind. I know and I understand that attachment theory and thinking about your own attachment style is very helpful for a lot of people. I'm not trying to take that away from you. I'm just trying to make sure that you have sound, well-rounded kind of knowledge base from which to make your subsequent decisions. Again, just to say, Relationships are complex as well, so don't put all your eggs in one basket. A lot of things are going to influence how you work out with someone or how you don't work out with someone. And yeah, take attachment maybe as one piece to the puzzle, but don't let it dictate the whole image. Okay, there are many more moving pieces that are at play when it comes to adult relationships. So I hope this helps. Let me know what you think and I'll see you again in the next one.